Hey there, beautiful teachers. Today, we're going to be looking at practice strategies that you can do with your students. These will be things that you can do in one-on-one, -on -one, regular, traditional, in-person lessons, or in online lessons, if that's how you're teaching right now, or in group sessions like I do in practice with pals. So these are real practical strategies that you can teach to your students to help them practice more effectively. And I'm happy to take any of your questions to those of you here live or watching on the replay. So let's get started. What's up beautiful teachers? Welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. It is so great to be back with you live again and I hope that you're all having a fabulous day. It is a beautiful sunny day here in Dublin so we're delighted to have the sun back because we've had a miserable run of weather <laughs> the last week or so and it's just great to have a bit of sunshine back so I can sit out and enjoy my peonies and I hope that you are having some fabulous weather where you are or enjoying uh, your time nonetheless, even if not. So today we're talking about practice and this is a big one and this was one of the requests that came through last week and it's one of my favourite things to talk about as many of you may know. Oh my gosh, I don't have it, do I? No, I don't have it behind me. Um, I have a book, my first book was written about practice because this is one of the things that I'm so passionate about helping students improve and helping teachers to teach better because I wasn't taught to practice. I don't know if you were, but I wasn't. I was just told to practice, but I wasn't taught how to practice. And if you've struggled with teaching your students these important skills, fundamental skills for them to improve, then you've come to the right spot. And I hope you'll look at our further resources after today as well. I do have an important few bits of housekeeping. Before I get to that, let me greet everyone. Um, Morgan, I love this. Avocado, toast, coffee, and Nicola. Morgan, you're in the States, right? Yeah, you're in the States. You're not in Oz. Because avocado on toast is like such an Aussie breakfast. Um... Obviously, you're not in Australia if you're starting your day now. Yeah. Uh, but you're having an Aussie breakfast, which I love. Fantastic way to start the day. Anna, hi, great to see you here. Carrie, Charlotte, Claire, Kelly, Laurie, welcome back again. Kelly, uh, Gary, hi. Jazreel, oh my gosh, awesome to see so many returning faces. If you are new to us here, I think Alana there may be new. Possibly Pam hasn't joined us live before. If you are new to us, welcome, a huge warm welcome to you. This is a community session. This is called a chat for a reason. So I had a comment recently on one of the videos that uh, it could have moved a bit faster. And I was like, my reply was, it's called a chat for a reason because Everything else I do does move fast. It is at that fast clip where I've edited things and I've cut everything down and it's designed to save you time, get straight to the point. That's my general style. However, sometimes we like to hang out a bit and chat shop and, and not be so direct and to the point. I have great information to share with you, but it's very much designed to be a community experience. It's designed to bring us together. I started these in our lockdown period, our lockdown saga, if it is continuing for you as it is for me to, in some respects. Um, I started these to bring us together. That's really what they were about. So if you want straight to the point right now, check out our other YouTube videos, check out the other stuff we do. But if you're here hanging out live or on the replay, then a huge warm welcome to you and participate in the chat, because that's what it's all about. It is a chat. Okay, so my few bits of housekeeping today. The first one is that we have a webinar coming up on Friday. So if you want to sign up for that, if you're already on the list, you might get notified about it, but it's good to just sign up there and to make sure you get that specific email that goes out to people that have signed up. So that's at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash funnels because it is going to be all about marketing funnels. And I know what you're thinking. Yuck. 
That sounds like a yucky subject, doesn't it? Sounds a bit... Blech. <laughs> Maybe you weren't thinking that. But if you know the word marketing funnels, it sounds a bit jargony. It sounds a bit like... Maybe it's going to be too businessy for us, right? But if you know me, you'll know that it's not going to be like that at all. It is going to be fun. And it is more importantly going to help you, not just with what we traditionally call marketing, but retention, which is the most important part of our marketing. Not just in maximizing our revenue and increasing our reach. It's about having a better, bigger impact on your community. Because if you can keep students in your studio, if they stay with you longer, you can have a bigger impact on them and their future as a musician and creating lifelong musicians in your area, right? So that's what that's about. It's not just jargony, funnels, yucky marketing tactics. It's about real stuff that works for studio owners and that helps students stay in your studio longer so that you can actually bring music into their lives. If that sounds good, you can sign up at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash funnels, okay? Um, MJ, yes, or Mary, uh, yes, I did talk about marketing funnels when I was in Melbourne at the Piano Pivot in a slightly different context, although this is definitely related. So I'm going to be going into that more in depth. So if you saw the inclusive piano teaching tactics, this is related to that, but it is a different slant on that. So definitely worth coming along if you saw that already. And nice, great stuff. Okay, so sign up for that. The other thing is, that you might have just seen, just posted right now, hot off the press, is that we have some new jobs opening up at Vibrant Music. So if you've ever thought that you might want to work with us, we're a lovely little, tiny little independent team, and we're all about flexibility within our positions, right? Um, and within the hours. So these the roles that tend to open up at Vibrant Music are part-time positions that tend to fit in alongside teaching. Because... Some teachers need a little bit of extra revenue on the side. You might want something that fits in alongside your teaching schedule that keeps you going when you have off teaching weeks. And that is, as I said, flexible. So both of those positions are completely part-time and the hours are completely flexible. It doesn't matter what time zone you're in even. And uh, they could be a fun role for you to look out for if you are looking for some extra money, extra income, and to have a big impact on the world. We're small, but we're mighty. So if you're interested in either of those, there's a marketing position and a community position opening up. Those are at colorfulkeys.ie slash jobs. And just a brief mention, we also have a position opening up at my local Colorful Keys piano studio. So if you want to apply for that, you can find a link in the menu at the top of Colorful Keys as well. So, practice. Are we ready to talk about practice? What do you need to know about practice strategies that you can teach your students? Have you found this more difficult to do in online lessons? Have you found it easier? Have you never taught practice before in your life and you're saying stum right now in the chat because you're like, I don't even know I was supposed to teach practice strategies. What is that? I don't have any practice strategy for myself. If you're feeling like that, then know that I was where you are right now. And it's totally fine. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. You're here to learn. That's what this is all about. So we're going to dive into a few specific practice strategies that I've been teaching online. And you'll see through those how we can teach these kind of repeatable processes. But before we even get to that... We want to go through the process of teaching practice. So this is how I can break it down for you in the most simple way that I know how. And this is basically what my book, The Piano Practice Physician, is designed to get you to do. So the first step to teaching piano practice is to experience it. For your student to experience it with you right there in the lesson. This is the most tempting step to skip. 
and it is therefore the most important for me to talk about. You have to sit there and walk through the practice strategy with your student in the lesson. You have to actually do it together, all of it, exactly as they will be expected to do it in their practice. This is the thing that my teachers never did with me and that really makes a difference. It takes time. It really does. And when you have such a busy lesson and you're trying to keep everything moving and ticking over, I know how tempting it is to skip this because, it, it, yeah, it takes ages sometimes. If you're walking a student through a practice strategy that they're supposed to do in their practice, it can take 10, 20 minutes. Oh my gosh, how can we possibly spare that lesson time? But here's the thing. How can you not? If you have students who are just wasting all of their practice time, because let's face it, a lot of them are, then your lesson time is wasted too, because they're not going to be able to follow up on that in their practice. So it is worth doing. You're not going to do it forever. You are going to get that time back in your lessons. You're not going to do this every week in that in-depth kind of way, 10, 20 minutes. But it is worth doing and it is worth doing pretty often. So you need to experience it together first. Then explain it. But not you. You don't explain it. Your student must explain to you what they did. They need to be able to relay the steps back to you to tell you what happened. If they don't have it embedded in their brain, they're not going to be able to repeat it, even if you write out instructions for them. Which brings me to my next step, which is instruct. And this is the one we probably normally always do. <laughs> we give them instructions on how to practice. A lot of us do. But we're skipping the first two. And if you skip the first two steps, there's no point doing this one. Oh, sorry, this one. <laughs> there's no point doing the instruction part because... They're not going to read the instructions. Even if they do, and especially if they don't have a parent to help them, they can't follow the, the instructions. If you've ever sat with a kid as they attempted to understand an exam question or like a test question, a kid under, say, age 12, you'll see how much they cannot follow instructions like that that are written out. Okay? It takes a lot of practice for them to do that and they have to. it has to be within a format that they've done before and this won't be. So, first two steps are the most important and the instructions are just a bit of a reminder. They're not the whole story. And then you need to repeat all of it. Okay? Not just some of it, you need to repeat all of those steps. You need to experience it together at the lesson. The same strategy. Expl have them explain it back to you instruct them in their practice notes on how to do it and repeat it again and again until it becomes embedded and it is a default behavior for them but that's going to take a long time okay so let me know if you've any questions about any of that if i'm making sense hit the like button on the video so that i know that we're all tracking okay and we're getting along together as we practice practicing together and then let me give you some specific strategies. But if you only take one thing from today, I don't want it to be those strategies. I want it to be that system. I want it to be those four steps that your students are actually experiencing practice with you, that they're able to explain it back to you, what they did, and that you follow up with instructions and repeat the process. Okay? So if you only get one thing from today, it should be that. Welcome to Helena. Great to have you back with us again. I got a big yes from Anna. Thank you so much. Glad to hear we're on the same page there. So, some strategies for you. Keep this in mind as we work through them. These are strategies that I've been using in my practice with PAL sessions. So if you want more about how I do those sessions and what they are, there are these group workshops that I've been doing online since we went online as a way to supplement my students' lessons when we don't have the big group workshops. So I've been doing weekly workshops for students to opt into and I've detailed more about those in a separate chat. So you guys can go and check that out if you're interested on details on that. But these strategies are not specific to those sessions. They could be used in sessions like that and taught to your students that way. And they can be done in regular lessons. It doesn't matter where you are. Okay, 
So, um, Carrie, that's such a good note. It's so important to take the time to do this. It's nice to hear again that we have permission as teachers to actually do it. And I love that note, Carrie, because it is about permission sometimes. It's about us telling ourselves that no, yes, this might feel slow. It might feel like we're not getting anywhere, but that this is valuable too, right? That this is a valuable use of our lesson time. Because it absolutely is. Even if you're not learning a new piece or notes or playing a game. Right? So, the first strategy that I shared at a practice with pals session was called bat bars. I'm not doing these in any particular order, by the way. So I displayed this on my screen. Don't worry about this. People often ask me about these graphics and stuff. And that's just because that's my thing. Right? That's my superpower. Did you read the article yesterday about superpowers? Go and check that out on the Colourful Geese blog if you haven't already after you finish this stream. Such an important thing to consider as a music teacher. But this is mine. I happen to have a background in design and so I put together fun little graphics and stuff like that. That's one of my superpowers. Now, the bat bars thing, you could have a stuffed bat, you could have a picture of a bat, anything will work to illustrate your point. The basic process of bat bars is that your student is going to play their bar and then close the book and try and play it without looking. Ta-da! And then they try and play it with their eyes closed. This is different depending on whether your student is playing a piece that jumps all over the place or is in one spot, it can be more or less challenging to do that final step. But the whole point of this is to get the information into your student's short-term memory. So please note that this is not about memorizing the piece and I do explain that to my students. They're not expected to remember that bar later. That's not the point. It could be the point, but it's not necessarily. It is valuable to get them to put the piece of it, piece of the piece into their working memory, their short-term memory, so that they process it in a different way. Once they have that with one bar, we'll add another one and then another one. I usually start this at the end of the piece, but you can also do it for any particular sticky spot. If it's just general practice, start at the end, not the beginning for sure. If you have a particular spot that your student needs to work on or that they know they want help with, then focus on that first. Okay. Alana, glad you like the idea. Let me know if that strategy makes sense to you guys. I'm going to sort of fly through these different strategies because I've got a few to share with you. But if any of them are unclear, that's what I'm here for. So chat to me, tell me that I'm not making sense and I will clarify. The next one... I'm going to do the classic. The next one is my one of my all-time favorites that I do all the time. Crossing the river, we call it. And the reason there are hedgehogs is because normally we do this with actual hedgehogs. Do I have my box? No, I don't. Anyway, um, normally I do this with the actual Owaco racers. A lot of them you will recognize these beautiful hedgehogs. It doesn't have to be them. It can be anything. But you put three things on the left of the piano, and because I was doing this on screen, I did it in a way where I can move them, and sometimes I accidentally change their size, and that's funny. I laugh, students laugh, it's all good. So, basically what we do is we put three things on the left of the piano, and then, if they play the piano, so you pick out a chunk, a few bars, whatever, and then if they play it correctly, they move the hedgehog or the thing, the lipstick, the pencils, whatever, to the right of the piano or the full board or the music stand, wherever it fits. And then they play it again. If they play it wrong, he goes back. If they play it correctly again, another one goes over. I think you got where I'm going with this. Once you really think this through, all this actually is, is a way to visualize or take the concept out of our brain and put it into a physical manifestation of 
three times correctly in a row. That's all that is. But when you make it crossing the river and you have this actual thing that you can move, it means that students have more fun with it and also that they're more likely to actually complete it three times in a row correctly. Because they can kind of think they did that, but they didn't if they don't have the physical things to move. A lot of people do something like this uh, in the chat there. That's really fun. But uh, they didn't have this title. So I'm glad I could add a title <laughs> to it. Sometimes we just call it the hedgehog game, but I like crossing the river. It's a fun title for it. Um, Gary had a question about bat bars, I believe. So Gary, I'm adding on. Um, but you could do it both ways. I'm adding another bar backwards from the end. But um, you would want to split that into chunks and start at a different spot if you're going to go through the whole piece or something like that. But normally won't have a chance of doing that. So again, start with a sticky spot or at the end. Yes, I love that, Nancy. Uh, that they use their own stuffed animals. So yeah, this is a this is one that works great in online lessons because you just get them to pick up random stuff from the, around, right? As long as it's something that won't fall between the keys, okay? Be careful about that. Don't want to cause any mishaps around pianos at home. But they just pick three random small objects from around the house. Um, yeah, a lot of students have their standard three go-to things already sitting there because this is one of our standard strategies that we use all the time. Okay, so that's two down. Hit the like button on the video if you're liking these ideas so far. And I'll fly through a few more for you so you have some variety to add to your lessons. But as you're going through all of them, remember this four-step process, okay? If you missed the start of the video, go back and check this out. So the next one... Oh, let me get to this question first. Do your students have something physical to move at home? Yeah, so they're picking out their own thing. I think I just kind of answered that just there. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Kelly, you've done it with food. You'd want it to be a small snack, right? Why do I call it bat bars? Because they have to do it without looking, Donna. So, you know, bats can't see. So they do it um, looking at the score, not looking at with their book closed, and then with their eyes closed. So that's why they're bats. Okay, moving forward then. So this one is called play hmm sh. Play hmm sh. It's one of the few that doesn't involve animals. But it's still fun because you get to say play him play him play him and that's really hard to say. Okay, so this one, they are going to play. I normally do it bar by bar. I should explain to Americans that means measure by measure. I normally go bar by bar, but you can do this two bars at a time, one line at a time. It depends on the length of the piece your student is working on and how fast you want them to get through it and all of that stuff. And it's good to vary that, but start bar by bar. So they're going to play one bar, hum the next bar, and think the third bar. In other words, shh. Right? So they're going to play, then hum, then shh, and then alternate again. Play, hum, shh. Play, hum, shh. Play, hum, shh. Play, hum, shh. Okay. I find that fun to say. Your students will too, if you're silly about it like me. So... By going through in that way, you're getting students to do two things. You're getting them to hum, which it's important to get th students singing. Um, and humming is a good go-to for, you know, equalizing those students who maybe might be a bit shy about singing. If they're able to hum it, they know the melody much more thoroughly. If they're able to think it, in time, they're audiating, which is important. Okay? So even if they don't get that perfectly straight away, it's a great practice for them to get into and it makes them think in a totally new way about their playing. And yet, what do we do while sh we're thinking the melody? We're thinking the music. So they're audiating it, if you're familiar with that term. So they're just hearing the music in their head that they would be playing, but they're not playing anything. 
thinking it. Okay, this is a really fun one, like I say, and great for getting students to audiate and to think about their piece in a new way. Some variety, as I mentioned, you can go two bars at a time, you can go one line at a time, and of course you should change the order as well, so that they're not always playing the same bars or thinking the same bars. So we do hum sh play and sh play hum, etc. Right? <laughs> The more variety, the better, and once your students get used to it. So remember, you're going to experience it together at the lesson. Have them explain it back to you, write instructions for how to do it, and repeat it over and over until this becomes a default behavior that they can do in their own piano practice. Oh my gosh, they're on top of each other. That's not intended. There we go. Okay, craps. What are the crabs about? So, when I asked students uh, what crabs do that was notable that might mean that I um, use this for a practice strategy, they said they have no real eyes. <laughs> Which I thought was funny because my cartoon crabs have like these crazy cartoon eyes um, and crabs don't look like that at all. And it was a good point from my student. <laughs> But I'm talking about the fact that they walk sideways. At least some of them do. So the crab walk is for sticky spots specifically. So you're going to start with the smallest possible little section that your student is having trouble with. Students often have trouble narrowing this down. And that's one of the important skills that they'll need to develop to do this effectively on their own. So ask them to come up with a spot that they're having trouble playing at the moment. And they'll normally start with a line or several bars or something. Have them play that and then help them to narrow in on what the real spot is. It's normally between a couple of notes, actually, that they like are missing this leap or they can't do that wrist rotation section or whatever. So narrow in on exactly where the problem is and then have them play that until they can do it successfully getting slower and slower on every repetition until they can do it successfully. And then the crab walk part is you include then one note before and one note after. So it's like the crab's side steps and side steps. And he's a very careful crab, as you'll see there. Careful crab walk. So he includes one note after and one note before. So now it's a little bit longer. And then he goes again, if that's successful. He's very careful though. And he's always checking for sharp glass in the sand that he's walking on. Okay? So if there's any glass, meaning if there's an error, he's going to stop and do that again until he's sure that the glass is gone. Then he goes again and again. So he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until the bit you're practicing is the same either side. So meaning if you start with a bar, it's going to be a bar before and a bar after. So you're adding the same distance either side. Hope that makes sense. That's a bit of a difficult one to visualise, so if you need me to play something, I can. Um, but I want to make sure we get through lots of strategies and we're almost out of time. Oh my gosh, time is flying today. Let me know if these tips are useful for you guys. So that's a careful crab walk. I think we've got two to go. Okay, this one is very simple. Koala caribou kangaroo. Koala caribou kangaroo is slow koala, medium caribou and fast kangaroo. Slow, medium, fast. That's all it means. Okay? It's good if you can illustrate how slow kangaroos are before you um, get them involved in this. So that they do really, really slow. This one might sound like nothing, but actually it's been one of my students' favourites. Because they like its simplicity, they like that they can execute it well, and they really do um, feel the difference. I always ask them when they finish it, playing very slow, medium and fast, or changing the order, you know, which one was the most difficult. And it's about 50-50 who says the slowest one is the most difficult or the fastest one. They all say caribou is the easiest because it's going to be the speed that they normally play, right? It's their default tempo. 
their medium, whatever the medium means to them for that piece right now. But yeah, it's interesting to see whether they find slow or fast most difficult. And if you haven't seen how slowly koalas move, I got to hold one in Australia in a sanctuary. They move glacially slow. They're very sleepy slow creatures. And they're completely adorable. The one that I held was called Millie. And yeah, she was ridiculously adorable. And I get to show my students a picture of me and Millie together when I'm illustrating this point as well. But that's a simple one. You can use that today. No problem, no difficulty. The animals just add a bit of fun to it and help students catch on to it as well. Um, Laurie, do I have them practice hands together or separately with all of these strategies? It, it would vary a lot. Generally together. I only use hand separate practice when I have a reason, actually. I was taught to practice hand separately. I don't know if I was taught to, but that's what I did. <laughs> Maybe I was just being bold. But I practiced hand separately first on most of my pieces growing up until... Um, my last teacher who scowled at me and said, like, what are you doing? When I st immediately broke things down without her saying to practice the right hand or the left hand, I just, you know, I couldn't do both together instantly, basically, or I didn't think I could. So I have my students practice hands together unless I have a reason for them to practice hands separately, which there often is, but there just isn't always. And I think it's good to get that practice of re reading hands simultaneously because if they're going to become effective sight readers, they have to be able to do that um, in real time. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on hand separate practice. That could be a whole other topic, couldn't it? Kelly uh, had some advice on that, which is great. I think it depends on what the trouble spot is. It may involve coordination of the hands. Yeah, exactly. In which case, it may need to be hands together. In general, I would go for hands together unless there's a reason not to. Yeah. Um, but I do understand the default of practicing hands separately. It's something a lot of people default to. And I find it a lot in transfer students. And it's something I only rethought maybe in the last few years. So might be some food for thought there. Now, oh, I clicked on the right one. That is surprising because they don't have labels. Okay, Beaky Rhythms. This is the last one. This is one of my favorites. This is great for any student who needs a bit of rhythm rehab. If they need, um, or just on a specific piece, but also just um, those students who struggle with rhythm in general, this is a good go-to strategy that you do with everything. Brand new pieces, stuff they've already been practicing all week, everything. If they're really struggling with rhythm, do this first. Beaky rhythms. So beaky rhythms is, they either clap if it's one hand, or tap if it's two hands, the rhythm. And they count or say kadai syllables or whatever rhythm system you're using with that student at that time. Doesn't matter, okay? So let's say it's something simple and, and the rhythm is ti 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 ta 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 two. So they clap that. Once they can do that successfully, independently of you, then they're going to play it, my keyboard on it is, on any one note, any one note. Okay, and then they play the actual notes or whatever it actually is. Okay, so clap one note. That's the beak part, by the way. It's supposed to be like a beak tapping it out. The bird couldn't possibly get across all of those notes. He's gonna just da 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 da, right? Like a telegram. Maybe Chuck would call it a no. Beaks are fun. More fun. Okay, I digress. If it is two hands, okay, you're going to tap with both hands. Ba, 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 or whatever the combination was. And then you're going to still play on any two notes. They can choose completely clashing notes if they like. Or they can do the same note in two different octaves. A lot of them go for that option. Um, and they're tapping the left hand rhythm with their left hand and the right hand with the rhythm with them with their right hand. That is hard to say. Okay, I hope that makes sense. 
that's maybe a little bit involved to tell you guys, but it is one of my favorites. So maybe rewind this video if you're a bit confused about that or ask me a question now before we sign off um, about beaky rhythms because that is really one of my absolute go-tos and favorites. And birds tapping things out with their beaks is quite a fun image to accompany that. Kelly, you have a few students who need to go to rhythm rehab. We all do, Kelly. If, if t a teacher thinks they don't have any students like that, they either have like two students or they haven't been paying attention. <laughs> Probably. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining me. I hope this has been useful for you. One more time, I'm going to ask you to hit like on this video if this has been of value to you, if it's been useful, and to make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you want more practice tips and other great resources, you can sign up for Vibrant Music Teaching at vibrantmusicteaching.com using our coupon code online to get a one-week trial for just one dollar. That is valid only until the end of June this month. It is expiring in a couple of weeks, so if you haven't signed up and you've been thinking about it and toying with the idea of trying it out, I'd encourage you to give it a go right now because we're not going to be repeating that deal. If you're available, I would love it if you join me again on Wednesday and Friday this week and next because we're continuing our Vibrant Music Teacher chats until the end of term here in Dublin at the end of June as well. And if you are interested in working for us, colourfulkeys.ie slash jobs is the link to go to to view the two assistant positions that we have open at the moment. And lastly, I hope you'll join me on the webinar. That's on Friday, a little bit later than these chats, so it might suit some of you better. Um, and you can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash funnels to sign up for that. It's going to be all about marketing in a very, very human and beautiful way. Okay? So I hope you found today's chat useful. Do share this link with a friend so they can join us on the next one. And I hope you have a fabulous rest of Monday, Tuesday, and hopefully I'll see you back here on Wednesday. See you then, guys.